the reason why they won, why ladies and gentlemen, because they had more points. More points. That's the side I take. Yo, classic line right there. That wasn't a finger roll. That was a Figaro, right? You all, man, yo, Dr. J, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Um, oh, man, I'm tripping, man. Like, I'm coming up short. Isaiah Thomas, that was the era that I grew up in, man. Kevin McHale, Larry Bird, Boston Celtics, uh, 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 Danny Ainge, and them cats would come over into the into the, into the the Philadelphia 76ers and have to come up against Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Dre. <laughs> Dr. J, right? And then on the other side, you had, oh, you know Charles Barkley today, the slim dude, you know, who got a lot of mouth and what. You ain't know the fat kid that used to run up and down that court that was slam dunk like he was, you know, uh, 185 pounds when he was waiting like 260, you know. I'm telling you, Charles Barkley, that era of basketball was phenomenal. And so was the hip-hop. You seen Lil Bow Wow, who's now Bow Wow on 106 and Park. But I promised y'all we had an extra special brother that was going to come on the show. We talked earlier in the uh, on the show about the Million Father March that we did in conjunction with the Black Star Plot Project from out of Chicago at Carroll City Middle School. We also dealt with, and we had our dear brother that was on the phone, um, Yo Jeff Carroll, the author of the Hip Hop Dating uh, Code that was here earlier talking about the Ray Rice situation. Um, but now we got an extra special brother that is going to help us ride out through this next hour on the line. He is an 11-year veteran of the National Basketball Association. He now sits on President Obama's Fatherhood Initiative Council. He's the author of this groundbreaking book, Fatherhood. We got my man on the line, my man, Atan Thomas. Are you there, sir? Yes, sir. I'm here. How you doing? Man, by God's grace, man, I'm doing good. How you feeling, my brother? Oh, I can't complain. You know, I, I could, but don't nobody want to hear that anymore. Man, nobody want to hear it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, man, I thank you so much for coming on the line. We've we've dealt with so much. I, were you able to plug in and see what we were talking about earlier? You know what? Actually, I was trying to do some homework on my son Malcolm, so I was kind of dipping in and out. He's yeah. trying to do this new this new math that I have no idea what it is. <laughs> yes, I didn't sir. learn this. I don't know this. Right. You know right. what I mean? This is a whole new concept to me, so I'm trying to learn it along with him. So that's what I was doing. Excellent, excellent, man. Well, I know that you were doing something extremely important, so uh, so that's not a problem at all. But the reason why I bring it up is because we were talking a little bit earlier about the Ray Rice situation. Of course, you right. know, the, 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 the Bruce Levinson. Is it Bruce Levinson? I'm saying it right, right? Bruce? Right. Bruce Levinson Something situation. Like that. Something like that. <laughs> right. Well, listen, yeah. man, I saw you earlier in the week on Chris Hayes, MSNBC. Mm. You held it down, man. Let's let you know what. Let's rewind a little bit, man. Tell the little tell the okay. people out there a little bit about yourself, your NBA history, your time at Syracuse, and even before that coming up. Who is uh, who is Aton Thomas? No, Lord, okay. I'm not good at talking about myself. <laughs> That's but, all right. No, I you know what? I play. I played in Syracuse for a year. Um, so I'm thinking the NBA draft. I uh, played 11 years in the NBA. Um, and while I was in the NBA, I got to involved with a lot of different things. You know, I, I was somebody who admired the athletes of the 60s who really used their position as a platform to speak out on things that they believed in, whether it's social justice or, you know, standing up for, for different rights or standing up for people who might not have a voice. You know what I mean? But as an athlete, you have a platform that many people don't have. You know, we got access to the media. We can say things, and thousands and millions of people can hear it, and we can convey different messages and kind of speak for an entire generation, an entire community. And so I just I've always wanted to use that position to the best of my ability. So the athletes that I grew up admiring were athletes like Muhammad Ali and Jim Brown and John Carlos and Tommy Smith and Bill Russell and Primo Abdul-Jabbar. That's who I, my mom taught me about when I was young. You know what I mean? So she kind of ingrained it in my head from an early age that you always have to stand for something. So I started standing for things in middle school. You know what I mean? Right, I remember right. in middle school, like the Rodney King verdict came out, and I had to take a stance on it. You know what I mean? And, and I organized different people in my, in my school and the players and stuff like that, and, and it kind of just went on from there. Nice. Yeah, it went on from there. I, I was in middle school, and, I mean, it was really shocking 
when those verdicts came out, I remember it. The jury finds that they're all not guilty. And it was, it was amazing, and the whole city was, like, erupting. And, right. you know, that was really my introduction to everything. That was, like, the first incident. You know what I mean? I picked up the uh, Malcolm X book when I was in seventh grade. And, like, right. shortly after that, the Rodney King verdict happened. And then it was like everything was changed. It was there. on and so, popping after that, right? Right, right, right. Man, um, you, you, there's so much you just said right there that got my mind thinking, man. But, you know, when you mentioned Muhammad Ali, um, and I think, and I was looking for it in the book right now, um, in, in mm -hmm. Fatherhood, which is, a, which is a collection of, of poems and essays and sayings by, uh, by, by prominent popular people, your man Nas, I think did, Nas has something in the book, doesn't he? Well, Nas didn't, but Kwali did. You might be thinking about Talib Kwali. Okay, okay. But what I did with the... What I, so, so what I did in the fatherhood book, right? Yeah. So I wanted to do something that was inspirational for young people. Right. You know what I mean? So I wanted to do something where, you know, young people are always hearing all the negative statistics all the time. But if you grow up in a single-parent household, you're going to end up dead in jail in a gang or drop out. Something terrible. Pregnant if you're a girl. Something terrible. Right. right. And I wanted to do, do something to show people that, no, it don't have to be that way no matter what the statistics say. You know what I mean? So you can defy the odds no matter what they are. So I wanted to say, okay, you don't have to believe me, but you can listen to these different men tell their stories. And then yeah. you can listen to these different men tell about how they are with their kids. Because you don't really hear that a lot, you, they, especially with athletes. So they always show the negative uh, cases, the bad cases, the cats with like seven baby mamas, and then the, yeah. the, the, the rappers the rappers with, you know what I mean? There's the custody about all that stuff. They show the bad cases all the time. They don't show the good cases. Right. So I wanted to put something together, and I just got some different guys to all tell their stories. So I got different guys like Grant Hill and Alan and, and um, Alex Houston and Ice Cube and um, then you know Yao Ming and Tay Diggs and Kareem Abdul Jabbar and Malcolm Jamal Water and you know Al Horford and Joe Johnson and I, you know so I just got a big collection of different people from all walks of life to all tell their stories. Nice. You know what I mean? And, and everybody has a story. You just might not know it. You, know, you, you might see the end product, you might see them on the court, or on the field, or in movies, but you don't know the road they had to take to get there. Right. So I wanted to use those stories as inspiration for young people, because when they, you know, young people listen to people who they recognize. That's just the way that it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? For sure. So, so if they hear somebody who they admire, who they watch them on TV, so they're listening reading about Joe King Noah and how he was able to make it to where he was, or listening to Kevin Durant talk about how he got his anger and frustrations out by working hard on the court. You know what I mean? He was just work for hours and hours, you know, so that was the way, like, like, his release. When people listen to stories like that, you know what I mean, they become inspired and they see themselves. They're like, okay, if he could make it, and he's going through all this, I could make it too. So young people are always giving all this negativity all the time, so it's just trying to give them something positive. So that was, that was the goal of my book. Well, I think I think I think you hit the goal on the mark, man. And the reason I brought up Nas before is because he made a statement in one of his songs. He said, uh, "He says athletes today are scared to make Muhammad Ali statements." And I think it was, you know, I hope I'm not saying it wrong. I, I, I think it might have been Dwight Howard or one of them yeah. brothers that sent that Twitter about Israel and in support for Palestine. About Gaza, right, right. Yeah, Free about Palestine. Gaza. And I mean, mm -hmm. when he, he retracted it so fast, man, he didn't just retract it. He was like, I don't even know what I was thinking about. I made. But uh, you know what? But you know what, though? But you yeah. know what? The fact that he even tweeted it out in the beginning shows that he's thinking about it, shows yeah. that he's paying attention to it. So even though he deleted it, it still went out to a million people, however many followers he has. Right. So it got people's attention. You know what I mean? So I'm looking at that. Cause I'm looking at that situation and looking at the positive with it, because right. he was watching along with the whole world of how the Israelis were slaughtering the Palestinians. I think now the count is up to like 2,000 Palestinians that they've slaughtered. Yeah. Right. So he was looking at that, and it, and it struck a nerve with him. So he was watching it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm looking now. at the positive. And they it's, came. It's, it's, it's up to three thousand, right? I'm at three thousand. That's yeah. what I'm at. You're right. You're right. I mean, yeah. at the time when at the time when he did it, it was in the low twos, and now it's like threes. And the same thing now happened 3, to Rihanna, 000. you know. So in in saying right. that, in saying that, one of the one of the challenges in the NBA today, and and going off, and it and it and it transfers to the NFL as well, is the fact right. that they say that there's no there's no um there's there's no uh like Big Brother system. 
for the older vets to be helping to coach the younger cats coming in. And I can't even imagine what it's like being 18, 19, 22, 23, and you got $100 million and people are, you know, they, girls are dropping on their knees when you walk inside, like what that must right. be like, man. And, you know, being a vet and being a, a rookie at one time, man, you think that that's a, that that's a, a proper uh, uh, analysis of what's happening between the young athletes that are that are like a Ray Rice, man. Nobody coach them, the aggression. You think that it's fair to say and putting some of the responsibility on the older athletes and coaching the young brothers and mentoring them? I mean, okay, this is what I'll say about that, okay? Now, first of all, of course, there's a lot of different temptations with athletes or just in life. And you got to learn how to grow up quick. you got to learn the people who are really want you for you and the, and the people who just want you because of what you can do. Right. So, so you start, you know, I, I started learning that in high school. So I got an early lesson on it. So there was, like, there was like girls that I knew all the way in middle school. They ain't never said two words to me. You know what I mean? So then yeah. I started playing a little bit. Brother started getting a little name in the paper and stuff. Oh, and all of a sudden I turned five. So now I'm five? Really? <laughs> so, 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 so I noticed that all the time. And my mom was always talking to me about it all the time. But, but talking about, you know, when you mentioned Ray Rice, you got to understand the system. The system, like, let's not get it twisted at all. The NFL does not care about anything else except for making money. That's right. it. They don't care about nothing else. Right. They did not suspend Ray Rice because he beat his wife. They suspended Ray Rice because a videotape of him beating his wife became public. Thank you. That is the only reason. They wouldn't have suspended him like that if, or, or, or terminated his contract like that if that didn't happen. So they wanted to do a PR move. They went into like a, a mode of like Olivia Pope, like trying to fix the problem. Like, they, <laughs> like they, were, they, had, they, they were trying to fix it, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and figure out how they could do it. So like, okay, everybody's mad. We, we got to show everybody that we're really um, on this cause and we're really on your side. So we're going to terminate this contract. You know what I mean? So, so, so everything that they were doing, but don't get it twisted like they really didn't know all along. And then it's so funny when Roger Goodell is on TV. And he's talking about how he never saw the tape. He just did the interview, uh, like yeah. maybe a few days ago. He said, I would have never allowed something like that if I would have seen the tape. We are a league of integrity and all this stuff, right? Yeah. And the next day, the AP said, no, wait a minute, actually, we sent that tape to you back in April. <laughs> yeah. But everybody knows he saw the tape. We, uh. Come on now. He's telling us that, you're telling me that the NFL can, can get the exact information of a, of a prospective draft um, like person, their 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 the number of girls that they've talked to, their first girlfriend, everything like that. They they have FBI and CIA agents, former FBI and former CIA agents working with them. Their job is to find out information. There's no way on earth that they did not see that tape. Wow. You know what I mean? But just but just looking at the way that they've handled everything. People have to understand that the NFL does... You know what I want to see? This is what I want to see. Yeah. I want to see a video. I want it to go viral. Anybody that's listening to this that takes this idea, go ahead and run with it. I'll just give it out. Okay. I want to see a bunch of women, right, all on football fields, recreating Michael Jackson. They don't really care about us. You know what I mean? And just oh. chanting it. Because that's really the situation. That's how they should feel. The NFL does not care about domestic violence, violence against women, none of that. They don't care about any of that. Yeah. But I just don't want people to really just think that just because he, he says, okay, now if anybody does this again, they're going to be banned for life. they just trying to appease. If you hurt the brand, you know what I mean? That's when things start to change. But they don't care anything about any of that. And he's shown that. So, but that's the thing. That's the thing with, with, with men. When they get into the league, when they get into the NFL, the NBA, it's on them to, have, to be responsible because the NFL is going to do what makes them money. And as soon as you start hurting the brand, then they're going to push you aside and get to the next person and act like they don't even, you know, they, they like turn their head at you. Like they have nothing to do, wash their hands completely of you. Wow. You know what I mean? But people have yeah. to understand the reality of it is that they don't care. That's the reality. They don't care about your growth, your, your, your emotional growth, your growth as a man, or anything. You have to care about that. And yeah. that's the message I always give young athletes. I love talking to young athletes. You know what I mean? I just talked to a big group of young athletes. There's about 200 of them that are about to go into high school. Guys to hoop, all of them. And I was telling them, listen, you're going to go to college, and the colleges are going to offer you the world, right? And you're yeah. going to get there, and after your years are up, if you don't produce, if you don't do well, 
they might not even return your phone calls. Like right now, I could call Syracuse and they'll return my phone calls. There's a lot of different players that can call Syracuse and they will not get a return phone call at all. That's right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Guys, again, it's, it's a business. Everything is a business. And you got to understand that you have to use them the way they're trying to use you. And that's, so, the, that's the nature of it. So, Atan, when, when you're talking to these athletes, man, how are you received uh -huh. by – the administration in the NFL, the I mean, in, in the NBA, or or you know, just just the the power, the gatekeepers, man. I know a lot of them really don't want you to be putting those. I remember what happened to Craig She's Hodges <laughs> when Craig Hodges yeah. was doing what he three point champ at the time, yeah. and he's wearing the African garb to the White House, and they found a way to get him off of the Bulls, man. What do you think about? Yeah. What happens to an athlete such as yourself who talks and walks and does what you do with the athletes? I mean, how much do you put on the line when you go out there and you represent truth to young athletes and to the world? What do you, what's what's well, that, at stake today? Well, that's the thing. You have to be able to stand up for something. That's the thing. So you have to be willing to stand up for something or you're going to get criticism. That, that's just part of it. I mean, especially now with the Twitter age and everything like that, you say one thing that people don't, don't, don't like, and they're gonna you're gonna get bombarded with hate mail, with, with hate tweets, with criticism. Yeah. Like, you, know, you know, some of the evil. Bit, I mean, and people talk so tough on Twitter. It's so amazing <laughs> to me all the time. Twitter they thugs. Uh. Cats. Yeah, Twitter thugs. Like I'm like, really? You really that tough? You know what I mean? But you got to be able to stand up for what you believe in, and that's that's just, that's just the nature of it. I mean, the athletes of the past, the athletes of the 60s, they risked everything, everything. Yeah. Muhammad Ali was at the top of his, uh, of his game, at the top of everything. And he said, no, I, this is what I believe. I don't, and people have to understand also, people look at Muhammad Ali and praise him and stuff like that now. But back then, mainstream America hated Muhammad Ali. That's right. All of them. They hated him. They despised him. If Twitter was out back in, in those days, man, yeah. I couldn't imagine. They absolutely hated him. But you I know what? Know. He stood up and he stood for what he believed in, and he said he was able to look himself in the mirror because he was able to be a man and stand up for what you believe in. And that's really what it's all about. You have to be able to do that. Well, listen, we, um, we, we're going to go off a little bit deeper into the fatherhood side because I know you got like a loving basketball real life story yourself, man. And we wanna <laughs> talk a <little laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about that on the other side, man. But I got a special video for you, man. We were looking for Michael Jackson. They don't care about us. We didn't find that one, but I found another right. one, man. We're going to go off into this video right quick. Catch us on the other side of time. Don't go nowhere. This is Luther Vandross, Dance With My Father. Father. We'll be right back. Back when I was a child.